These are the last teachings of Jesus' final discourse from the Gospel of Matthew. This story follows a series of six parables about being ready for the coming of the Son of Man. In the story, Jesus tells the crowd itself, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. This is a completely unique text, not found in any of the other Gospels. And unlike the teachings that precede it, it's not really a parable. Although some people refer to it as such. Parables use worldly scenes, right? They, they use things from our everyday lives to teach us a lesson, usually about the kingdom of heaven. But this is a heavenly scene, a grand vision, an end of time Jesus gathering the nations together for final judgment. The goats and the sheep represent the people of the nations. Who do you identify with in this story? Anyone? Do you identify with the goats? Or do you identify with the sheep? With the bad people or with the good people? In this story, Jesus is the judge who separates the people, some going to eternal life and others to eternal punishment. Notice that the only criteria given in the story for deciding the good from the bad is how the least of these were treated. It's personal and specific. You cared for the least of these or you did not. No mention of confession of faith in Christ, no grace, justification, or forgiveness of sin. What counts is how you treat people in need. The absolutely beautiful and poetic statement, as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. As you did it to the least of these, you did it to Jesus. This is remarkable. The very idea that God would be found in the weak, the sick, in criminals, or the homeless, totally violated the common sense of the time, and, and to some degree this time as well, although we have the benefit of this story now. When this was written, leaders openly claimed to be gods and expected to be treated accordingly. It was common knowledge of the time. And the reason people were poor, the reason people were sick, in jail, was because they lacked a proper connection to God. The hungry, the sick, and the criminals were to blame for their sad lot in life. They must have done something to displease God. This story turns that whole narrative totally upside down. What's important, Jesus says, is not caring for the successful, but reducing the suffering of the losers. Only those who cared for the least of these go on to eternal life in this story. Notice also that both groups, the good and the bad, the sheep and the goats, are confused by the explanation. When did we ignore you, Lord? Or when did we not ignore you? They both ask. This outcome was a surprise to both groups. What did the goats or those condemned to eternal punishment do in this story that was so bad to justify eternal punishment? They hadn't stolen or murdered or anything like that. All they did, all they did was ignore the suffering of someone else. That's all. This is an interesting text to be faced with the Sunday before Thanksgiving. This is supposed to be a time to be thankful, to sing thankful songs and to pray thankful prayers. And yet we find ourselves faced with this apocalyptic text. Thanksgiving is a time to gather family together in love, not a time to judge the nations. Still, this scripture is a huge favorite within the Christian community. 
And it's been read on this particular Sunday, the final Sunday before Advent, far longer than we've been celebrating Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving came later. This scripture is a huge favorite in our church too. Even though admittedly we don't spend that much time talking about God's judgment. We don't. And maybe for good reason. Jesus didn't spend that much time talking about God's judgment either. Although he may have spent more time on it than we do. We are a love and hospitality based church. Not a fire and brimstone fear based church. It's not who we are. And we also are not inclined to accept simple interpretations of something as complicated and rich as our relationship to God through Jesus Christ. We don't generally look at this text as some kind of formula to avoid hell and obtain heaven, do we? Simply providing charity for the least of these is no more of a guarantee of rewards in the afterlife than simply stating that Jesus is our failure, is our savior. <laughs> Sorry, Jesus. I didn't mean that. <laughs> Our faith journey is deeper, more complicated than that. But it's also more transformative. And by transformative, I mean something that challenges us spiritually. Something that fosters spiritual growth. Something that allows us to appreciate life in deeper and more significant ways. And what is transformative, though, for one person is not necessarily transformative for another. Transformative readings of Scripture tend to be individual in nature and therefore subjective. This particular story, however, has a historical reputation for being transformative for many different kinds of people. As is often the case, different kinds of people read the story in very different ways. Depending where you are on your spiritual and your physical journey through life, you might actually identify with different groups in this story. For those among us who have been blessed with a good education, a good job, and have lived a charitable life, that's a lot of us. We tend to see this text as congratulations and recognition for our good deeds. We have fed the hungry many times, have visited the sick. We even sometimes invited a stranger home to join us for Thanksgiving. It's a comforting interpretation, one totally suitable for Thanksgiving, but not necessarily an interpretation that is particularly transformative. It might be a valid interpretation, but not necessarily spiritually helpful or challenging. It's too easy for this line of interpretation to be all about us. Comforting interpretations of Scripture often lead us, often leave us or, or lead us to be a bit self-absorbed. And that's needed sometimes. However, comfortable interpretations don't help us grow much beyond where we already are. Which again, is not always bad, but more is possible. When we're ready. To help us dig into this text's transformative potential, let's look at the text from another angle. I'm pretty sure that each of us can identify people in the world that we think fill the bill as goats. And again, it's not particularly helpful or transformative interpretation to sit around and talk about those goats. It leaves us feeling smug, and it's also not conducive to spiritual growth. So let's not go there. Instead, we have the sheets and the goats. Who else is in the story? What if you grew up in the inner city and got kicked out of school when you were 16? Had some issues with alcohol and spent some time in jail? You got out of jail five years ago and no one will hire you or give you a chance. So now you are homeless again. 
What does this text look like to a person in that situation? Someone who has no connections, no family, no friends. A person who is literally rejected. One who is at the bottom of life could really draw some pretty harsh conclusions about the rest of the world based on this text. People ignored me when I was poor and hungry, and when I was in jail, and when I was homeless. They're all destined to eternal punishment, particularly those in my family who will not even return my calls. A little different interpretation. While this individual might actually feel some comfort in thinking that those who ignore this person will get their due, this interpretation is also not very transformative, is, is it? It does, not, it does nothing to push this person forward, to help this person grow. And I've heard people use this text as part of a demand for charity before. People have looked me square in the eye and said, your religion says you have to give me $10 because I'm poor. That's not a very transformative interpretation of this text either. You can see how drastically different this text looks depending on which group of people you identify with. This can lead to an important and potentially transformative understanding of this scripture as well. If you perceive yourself to be one of the righteous or one of the damned or as one of the least of these, how you hear this text will adjust accordingly. So who do you identify with in this story? The process of spiritual growth and transformation is about changing how we look at the world. And to do that, we have to be able to recognize the lens that we're currently using. Understanding your current lens or your current worldview is usually a step towards a new and clearer lens. Understanding your current lens is a step towards a better lens. If we open our eyes wide enough, it might even occur to us that we actually can identify with all of these groups, can't we? We are the goats. We are the sheep. We are the least of these. We're all of them. This story is far more transformative and we're able to see ourselves as the damned, as the righteous, as the least of these, all wrapped up in one. Maybe not always at the same time. Let me give you an example. A very wealthy person can become the least of these in the blink of an eye when suddenly in the hospital with a life-threatening condition. Boom. Someone who's homeless can and will encounter someone who is even worse off suddenly switching roles from the least of these to a sheep or goat. Boom. In a second. Homeless folks have to decide when and when not to help, too. Most of us will at times help someone who's suffering, and at other times we will walk away. Few of us are totally consistent. This story is transformative in the realization that we are a mixed bag and that we will find ourselves may be as surprised as those in this story, on all sides of this story. This story is also transformative in its focus on the least of these as a representation of God. In many ways, a spiritual journey is a search for God, a search for love, a search for peace, a search for your place in the universe. Throughout much of history, the words and imagery used to describe God have referred to that which is above, right? That which is powerful. Heaven is up, hell is down. Those with great power were given that power by God, and those who are powerless are furthest from God. Again, this story throws out that understanding. It flips the pyramid. It provides a new model of reality that challenges our human view of life. Look to the least of these for God. What? The dirty, smelly, homeless, sick, 
imprisoned these two keys? Them? What? God is most present to me in them? This message would not be so powerful if not for the fact that Jesus himself lived as the least of these. Jesus, with this story, in some ways explains why he chose to spend his precious time on earth with the people that human society had rejected. Think of how much more Jesus would have gotten done if he would have hung out with the leaders rather than the losers. He probably could have gotten some laws passed, maybe some tax breaks for people who were stretched. It's not what he did. Jesus spent most of his time with the lowly, with those who were suffering. This is transformative. The weak, the least of these, are identified by their suffering. Not by if the suffering was their fault or not, just by the fact of their suffering. How does someone else's suffering impact you? How does it impact you when you respond? How does it impact you when you don't respond? When you see suffering and you walk away? How does that feel? A life that seeks to reduce suffering in honest and authentic ways is almost always a life that is being transformed and a life that is transformational for others. This interpretation of today's scripture has resulted in the opening and operation of many a soup kitchen and many a shelter all over the world. Many a faithful person has encountered this text, looked around them, and dedicated their lives to serving the least of these. And God bless them all. Other people read this text, and in addition to charity, feel called to examine and reform the systems and processes that create such a big need for soup kitchens and shelters. Some feel called to change our way of life, the way we eat, travel, and think, to minimize suffering and problems we may be causing for others around us, directly or indirectly. God bless them as well. It's actually a tall order. This idea of seeing God in the least of these. One that requires transformation on multiple levels. What are your relationships with those who are suffering and seemingly have nothing to offer you in return? Do you see them only as the subject of your charity? Or can you see them as those whom Jesus would serve? Jesus said, just as you did it to the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me, to me. Today's story tells us that if you can't see God in the least of these who are around you, You aren't looking. A good reminder during this Thanksgiving season and always. Amen.